Um, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Joint Astrophysics Colloquium. Uh, I'm honored to introduce our speaker today, Professor Rob Fender, who kindly agree uh, to give us uh, uh, this talk uh, to the Italian commun astrophysics community. Um, he is the um, head of the uh, astrophysics sub-department within the physics department of the University of Oxford. Um, previous in his career, he was professor to University of Southampton, professor of physics, and University of Amsterdam, visiting professor to University of Grenoble. And since 2010, he is a SKA professor at the University of Cape Town. Um, he had various responsibilities during his careers. Uh, I just mentioned some of them, I think the most important. He was chair of uh, the SKA Transcend Science Working Group. He led the UK collaboration within the Lofer project. He was uh, awarded in 2011 an ARC Advanced Investigator Grant. And since uh, uh, 2021, he is the co-lead of the Next Generation uh, Event Horizon Telescope, uh, working on uh, astrophysical transients. Uh, moreover, he was a recipient of several prizes and research fellowships, and, and I will mention only the last one, I think, because they are a lot. And um, in 2020, he was award awarded uh, uh, with a Herschel Medal of Royal Astronomical Society for investigation of outstanding merit in observational astrophysics. Uh, in recognition of his work uh, uh, in accretion around the black hole and connection with the relativistic jet. So uh, the research interests of Professor Fender are in the areas of accretion and ejection processes around the uh, relativistic objects, uh, mostly via observation uh, with radio in the radio domain uh, with various radio telescopes like Merlin and AMI LA and Mercat as well as uh, studies of, uh, and, and of target uh, studies and uh, a search for radio transients. And now uh, Professor Fender will talk about towards precision calorimetry of black hole accretion. And if Rob is ready, we, you can start uh, when you, you are ready. Okay, so, uh, well, thank you, Fiamma, for the... Uh... For the invitation and for the, the the very kind and generous introduction, um, I have to say I wish I was in Rome right now uh, for a variety of reasons, not least the the weather, which in the UK has segued from from uh, a miserable summer to a miserable autumn. Um, I should also say I'd like to say hello to all the people that I know who are on the call. That I saw there's a there's a number of people that I know on this call, and um, I very much wish to uh, to see you again in person as soon as possible. Okay, so I had this I had this rather ambitious title towards precision calorimetry of black hole accretion, of course. Those of you who know my work will know that what I'm really talking about uh, here is jets, but knowing what the power and energy content is in the jets is really uh, key to, uh, to understanding, or one of the keys to, to balancing the, uh, the energy budget for the whole of accretion around black holes. So what I'm talking about here very naively is that, you know, we, we are now live in an era where you can actually image the event horizons uh, of black holes, and I still find it remarkable that that we work on these uh, these extraordinary objects and that you know there are at least 100 million of these things floating around within our own galaxy alone and we know that um the the flow of energy around black holes goes something like this you drop mass down towards the black hole and you change its con its uh, initial potential energy into a kinetic energy it thermalizes probably um it produces radiation some of the energy is advected across the event horizon of the black hole. And I don't just mean here, obviously, that mass crosses the event horizon. We know that's inevitable, but also that in some sense, the matter is still hot, some of the matter when it crosses the event horizon. So energy which could have been liberated uh, to, to the outside universe is lost across the event horizon. And the other main uh, energy channel is in the form of kinetic energy, which for some objects is in the form of strong accretion disk winds. But for the objects which I study and the phases in accretion uh, of those objects, which I primarily study, is in the form of relativistic jets. Now, in my own estimation, I would say that we can normally estimate for some of these objects 
And I include here both AGN, for which there are relatively good measures um, of the, the density and temperature of the gas in the centres of galaxies, but also in binary systems where we can get a relatively accurate estimate of the mass transfer rate in the binary. I would say we can probably uh, uh, estimate the rate of flow of the mass reservoir to about one order of magnitude. The radiation we can probably do even better on. We can probably, in some cases, capture pretty much all of the radiation coming from these objects so we get a very accurate measure of this but the problem is at least as far as i see it and in the objects i've tried to work this out for is that the uncertainties uh, on the kinetic energy which is going into these jets is very very huge it's uh, it's several orders of magnitude and i'm talking about my own work here as well and then the problem is of course because that feeds in uh, it's very hard for us to, to balance this whole equation so essentially i'm talking about the flow of power here and this has been something which uh, has has really been something I've been chasing down for 20 years now. Now, of course, there's all sorts of very exciting things going on around black holes. There are GRMHD simulations which show you the flow of the accretion flow, the connection to the uh, to the jet. But those those simulations are not at present able to provide us with good matches to observational data and therefore the power. So it's really based upon relatively straightforward observations that we can try and make our best power estimates. So let me give a very brief preamble um, on the kind of objects which I'm going to talk about in this talk, which are stellar mass black holes in X-ray binary systems. Um, the simple way that I view the power associated with the jets from these systems and therefore how I aim to try and measure it, and a bit about the Meerkat radio telescope, which from an observational point of view uh, is the star of the show uh, in this talk. So X-ray binaries, as many of you on this call know, um, are uh, binary systems in which one component is a black hole with a mass somewhere in the range between about three uh, and 20 solar masses. The inner accretion flow around uh, stellar mass black holes in these binary systems, uh, because of the size um, uh, of the accretion flow just above the event horizon, emits in the X-ray band, so we get strong signals from the inner few hundred gravitational radii of the inflowing matter in X-rays. The next time we see a signal that's in the jet as it propagates away from the black hole, um, it is about 100 milliseconds, uh, which is where we see signals in the near infrared. And then subsequently, uh, the jet emission, which is dominated by synchrotron emission, uh, comes to dominate in the radio and millimeter bands, which is where we do a lot of our studies. Now, I want to make an early point, which I'll come back to you later on, which is that um, I think for most jets, from black holes, but certainly for the ones which I study, you can only really measure the total jet power when you can see the jet decelerate. And I'll explain why that is. So if we imagine that our radio emitting region, which is associated with our jet has some internal energy, um, uh, that's uh, the energy in particles and magnetic field when you have a relativistic plasma that's producing synchrotron emission. And this blob of matter or this shock or whatever it is, is thrown to the right uh, with some bulk Lorentz factor then in nearly all cases for these uh, for the re interesting relativistic jets, the initial bulk Lorentz factor is much greater than one, which means kinetic energy dominates the energy uh, in these ejector. And of course, we know that in some cases uh, in astrophysics, gamma is really much, much larger than one. In, in gamma ray bursts, it's 100 or more. And in some blazars, it's certainly greater than 30. So this means the energy output is dominated not by the internal energy of the particles and field, but by the kinetic energy. However, um, I'll, I'll tell you now, uh, uh, and uh, I will demonstrate later on in the talk, that you can't really accurately measure gamma until you begin to see deceleration. But then the other point is that the radiation we observe uh, from, uh, these, uh, from these jet components is essentially just directly related to the internal energy via uh, Doppler uh, shifts. So it's actually very hard until we can directly measure gamma to understand what the total energy budget of these jets is. Now, of course, um, there has been a great deal of work uh, over the decades on estimating the power of, from, uh, of relativistic jets from black holes and other accreting objects. And in most cases, it's done in the following way, which is that you look at the large scale action uh, of these jets on their surrounding environment. And this is where the jets have essentially decelerated in their ambient, ambient environment. They've lost all their kinetic energy and it's been uh, recycled via, with some efficiency back into in situ particle acceleration. So I show you on the left here an image of Cygnus A, which was the first radio source in Cygnus. And this is, uh, these are, this is the radio jet and radio lobes from a black hole with about a billion solar masses. 
And on the right, you see a radio image of the field around the first X-ray source discovered in Cygnus, which was Cygnus X1. And this contains a black hole uh, of mass, about 10 solar masses. Now, these radio lobes around Cygnus, X, uh, Cygnus A were probably produced on a time scale of 10 to the 7 to 10 to the 8 years. And in the case of Cygnus X1, this radio bubble here, we believe there's a jet propagating in this direction, inflating this bubble. This bubble here was probably produced over a time scale of a million years or so. So we can get the time averaged uh, jet power. But when we're at a stage now where we can really look at the, the actual physical conditions around the time of launch of individual jets, what we really want to do is actually be able to track uh, the, the total jet power in an individual event. So the way to do this is uh, we need uh, to track jets all the way from their moment of launch to their moment of deceleration in the surrounding ambient medium. Uh, let me also say something about Meerkat. A lot of the most exciting results I'm going to present in this talk come from the Meerkat radio telescope. Meerkat is an SKA precursor, which uh, was inaugurated in 2018. It's an absolutely beautiful, gleaming new array of 64 13 and a half meter dishes in the Karoo in South Africa. And it's an extraordinarily sensitive uh, and beautiful wide field radio telescope. In 2023 uh, or so, Meerkat will be uh, upgraded to the so-called Meerkat Plus, which is the addition of a handful of antennas, but uh, more importantly, extending, doubling the, the baseline, so doubling the angular resolution. And then on a time scale of approximately 2027, uh, uh, Meerkat will, will still remain, but will have expanded out uh, to become the mid frequency component of the phase one of the SK. An important thing to remember here is that SK1 mid will be building antennas around the Meerkat core. So the Meerkat core has a diameter of just a few kilometers. SK1 mid will go out to 150 kilometers, but Meerkat will still be there as the central core of SK1 mid. Um, so for the past three years, uh, myself and Patrick Vout have been leading the Thundercat project, which is an approved five year Meerkat large survey project. And one of the things we've been doing is monitoring the radio emission from accreting black holes and neutron stars within our galaxy. Now, those of you who work on X-ray binaries and X-ray transients will be familiar with a movie like this, um, but you will usually have seen it uh, uh, as a movie of the X-ray sky. So this is, a, this is a movie over the first two, two and a half years of Thundercat. And what we do is every time we have uh, intelligence from other wavelengths or ATELs that there is an active accretion going on in an X-ray binary or neutron star, we track it uh, with Meerkat. There's one exception, which is a very well-known source called GX339-4, which you can see beating just to the left uh, of the, the galactic center there. Um, and that source we are monitoring every single week for the whole five years of the program to get a really unique uh, measure of the relation between uh, jet production and X-ray emission in these sources. So probably at this stage, some of you have seen me talk before, will be expecting me to pop up a, a hardness intensity diagram, uh, the so-called uh, turtle head or Q diagram and start talking about that. I'm not gonna do that in this talk, but instead what I'm gonna do next is I'm gonna talk about the case study of one particular source, which is this black hole binary here, MAXIJ1820. So MAXIJ1820 is an X-ray binary which, uh, which was newly discovered by the MAXI X-ray telescope on the space station in 2018 uh, and got extensive coverage with pretty much uh, all X-ray and radio telescopes and, and optical telescopes uh, around the world. And this is a really beautiful case study of how we can track the accretion flow around the time when an ejection occurs all the way out to the moments when that ejection about a year later decelerates in the interstellar medium. Um, I should mention the heroes of the piece. So there are there are many people who have been involved uh, uh, in this project, but these are the four people who I think, at least in the context of my work, led the most important papers. Callum Wood is an undergraduate at Curtin University, soon to be starting his PhD, working with James Miller-Jones. Matilda Espinas and Francesco Caritanuto are PhD students working with Stefan Corbell uh, in Paris. And Joe Bright was a PhD student working with myself in Oxford when this project began and has subsequently been a postdoc at Northwestern and is now uh, on his second postdoc effectively um, at Berkeley. And these four people really did the, the majority of the work that I'm going to show in the following. 
So let's start off with the time uh, X-ray observations around the time when a relativistic ejection uh, occurred from this source. So this uh, this beautiful diagram is actually uh, not from one of those people, but from uh, Jeroen Homan's paper in 2020. So we'll start on the left hand side um, and we will look at days of July 2018 and we will start by looking at the X-ray emission from this source and the associated hardness ratio over a six day period. So over this six day period, we can see that the X-ray flux was rising and then it, it, um, it underwent a very dramatic rise uh, sometime around July the 6th, which was associated, excuse me, with a dramatic hardening of the X-ray spectrum. Now, around the same time, so this was as the source was uh, was beginning to to make a transition from the hard spectral state to the soft spectral state. And for those of you who don't know, that's around the time when we expect to see a decrease in a steady jet, which has persisted previously and a transition briefly to a relativistic ejection before the jet essentially disappears in the subsequent soft state. So we were monitoring this source daily with the Amy radio telescope and what we saw um, the day before this transition is that there was a decline in the uh, the radio flux at 16 gigahertz and that was consistent with the slow turning off or suppression uh, of the the hard state jet and then on the uh, on the 6th 7th we saw a strong radio flare with amy and then by observations the next day we saw uh, radio points which were more or less uh, 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 looked like an extension of the decay which we'd seen on the previous day the right hand panels show uh, the, con the compressed data just around from the period of the 6th and 7th uh, of July. So it's just between the dotted lines on the left. So again, this is a zoom in uh, of three X-ray bands and we can see um, in all three bands uh, this significant increase in flux. And we also see this gray band marked here, which is a, which is uh, indicates the time when a particular type of quasi periodic oscillation and this is an oscillation of the whole of the inner accretion flow was present. And this QPO um, and the evolution of the variability of the inner accretion flow is shown very dramatically in this beautiful lower right panel here, which is a dynamic power spectrum uh, uh, of the inner accretion flow around the source at this time. So what we see is that initially there was a uh, strong variability on, on a range of timescales from uh, from uh, at least zero to, to 20 hertz or so, and in, indeed certainly at higher frequencies, with a drift of certain characteristic frequencies to higher frequencies as time goes on. So time's increasing to the right and frequencies increasing upwards. Shortly before the radio flare, however, all of the broadband power disappeared and all that was left was an oscillation at around five hertz. And this is a, a phenomenon which is called the type B QPO and has been uh, broadly speaking, associated uh, with relativistic ejections in the past. And then just after the flare started, essentially all the power disappeared from the X-ray power spectrum, which indicated that a state transition had occurred. So we have beautiful data really telling us how the accretion flow very close to the black hole is varying at this time. Callum Wood uh, recently presented uh, the results from radio VLBI observations, which were made shortly after this epoch. So there are two epochs uh, of VLBI observations in Wood et al, which I present in these two figures here. The black hole X-ray binary is where the cross is. And what you see in the first epoch is that there is very clearly a strong component uh, to the west, or actually in this case, mostly nearly to the south uh, of the black hole, which is also extended and possibly a fainter component, which is the, the counter jet uh, on the other side. And you can see that between the two epochs, uh, the component has moved. So if you track uh, the, the motion of this uh, component A, then you can see it's moving with a velocity of about 0.3 C or 30% the speed of light. The problem with this is that by the time Callum had analyzed these data, we already knew from Merlin and then VLA and then Meerkat data on larger angular scales that there were superluminal components. That is components who are moving at an apparent velocity of C or greater. So it couldn't be this component unless somehow it had managed to speed up. So Callum and James together worked on a method where they actually adjust the phase tracking center of their VLBI data, essentially tracking where they thought this fast moving component should be, extrapolating back from the larger scales and then re-image their data. Um, and when they did so, they recovered this component here, which we're calling component C. 
This component here is entirely consistent in its position uh, with the, uh, the relativistic ejection, which was seen on larger scales. The remarkable thing about this, though, is that we have the proper motion of component A, which means that we know when it was launched, and we have the proper motion of component C because we can connect it to larger scales. And component A, the slow moving component, was launched before component C. And I'll show you the timeline of this shortly. But essentially, the faster moving, the more relativistic uh, moving component must have moved through or at least past the slower moving jet on its way out to propagate to larger distances. Once you'd gone beyond, beyond those small scales, um, then we took over with uh, observations with email in the VLA and Meerkat. And what you see here is uh, one subset of those data from Joe Bright's paper in Nature Astronomy in 2020. And we were able to track these ejecta out to very large distances uh, from the black hole. Uh, to a time scale of over half a year um, after ejection. And I just want to, to, to point out how remarkable this is. Um, normally, when we look at the ejector from these black holes, we normally track them out to maybe an arc second or so, and then they essentially disappear, and we don't really know what happens to them. Uh, this is the light curve of the radio emission from this source. So we saw an initial uh, rapid decay, which we thought was maybe consistent with rapid expansion of the ejector, but then the ejector did not fade away, but in fact, uh, they rebrightened and had this very slow decay phase, which allowed us to track them out to large distances. There's perhaps a break uh, in the decay rate here, but the most important epoch is this epoch, where we had simultaneous observations at high resolution with E. Merlin and low resolution with Meerkat at the same frequency. And uh, because we uh, measured different fluxes on different angular scales, we were able to directly estimate the size of the ejector and hence the energy uh, of the ejector. Let me apologize for any background noise if you can hear it. So the way this works is uh, you look at this image here, the contours which you're seeing here, um, these are the contours from the Meerkat observations which show a slightly resolved core. But if you look with the e Merlin observations, then you see a bright spot here, which is the ejector, and you also still see the core. So essentially what you're seeing with Meerkat is Meerkat is not resolving the whole of the ejector, we think, but e Merlin was just re uh, uh, detecting perhaps some small bright spot within the ejector. There's actually, uh, it's also true that E. Merlin would have still picked up some flux from a more diffuse structure. If we have the size and the flux from a synchrotron emitting component, this allows us to get the minimum energy associated with this component. And in this case, this told us that at 90 days after ejection, you had greater than 10 to the 42 ergs still in the ejector and the ejector was still moving superluminally at this stage, which means that the kinetic energy was probably still dominating over this internal energy. So that's a very large amount of energy, and it's much more than we would have estimated from radio flaring that we saw around the time of the ejection. Um, there were also X-ray observations uh, of this jet. So the jet, both the approaching side of the jet and the receding side of the jet were detected by Chandra. This is the work of Matilda Espinas, um, and the spectrum from radio all the way through X-rays is consistent with being optically thin synchrotron emission over eight decades in frequency. So this is the complete timeline uh, of the ejector all the way out to deceleration uh, as presented in Wood et al., but uh, similar figures are presented in uh, uh, Espinas and in Bright. The first thing to note, uh, this is the angular separation of the ejector as a function of time, is that after a phase where they initially appeared to be moving ballistically, the ejector clearly started to decelerate and slow down in the interstellar medium. The other thing to note is that right here in the center, Callum has put an inset showing the sequence of events. So I'll just remind you what they were. There was a slow moving component which was ejected, moving at about 0.3 C. There was a very dramatic change in the X-ray power spectrum. That is the variability of the flow just above the, the, the black hole, uh, such that a type B QPO appeared. And then it looks like these superluminal ejections occurred around the time when the peak of the Amy radio flare occurred. So these are really, really superb data. And we've never had really a data set like this uh, prior to this compilation of work on 1820. Um, so let me talk a little bit about precision calorimetry of the jet and how I think we can track the internal energy and the Lorentz factor of these ejecta all the way from launch to their termination in the interstellar medium. And thereby, uh, by doing so, we should be able to measure the total energy budget of these ejections. 
So there are two competing models. I say competing, they're not really competing. There are two, there are there are many models. There are two models I'm going to present here for the radio mission from uh, from radio jets uh, in these kinds of sources. The original model by van der Land for an expanding synchrotron emitting blob was published in 1966 and had essentially no dynamics. So that, that's not a solution to, to our problem. But you can modify it a bit for dynamics. In this model, um, a blob loses energy, PDV work essentially as it expands, but we can also have it moving through the interstellar medium. And we can say that it decelerates as it interacts with the interstellar medium. And this deceleration feeds back some of its initial kinetic energy into reheating the particles. And you can get plausible solutions to, to the observations using this model um, in some cases. Uh, a much more widely accepted model is the blast wave model of Blanford and McKee, which is widely accepted in a large range uh, of astrophysics. I should say van der Land is really not being used anywhere else apart from X-ray binaries uh, these days. Um, and of course, the blast wave model is the, the basis for essentially all the models of GRBs. And in this case, you have a shock moving forward, a forward shock. You also have a reverse shock propagating back into your ejector. And the flux that you see essentially depends upon the movement of spectral peaks and in some cases, radiation losses. And again, deceleration converts the initial kinetic energy back into internal energy. Um, just as a side note, I've been working a little bit on GRBs recently, and this is my assessment of the state of the two fields. So, so there's no data going to appear on this figure. This is just, a, imagine a sketch on the back of the envelope. So GRBs have really, really good models. There are hundreds and hundreds of lines of theory written for GRBs. And every time there are one or two data points measured, then there is a model which can fit them and some physics extracted. X-ray binaries have extraordinarily beautiful data. I have some X-ray binary uh, outbursts where I have 17,000 individual detections of the X-ray binary in the radio band during that outburst. And the, th the, the models that we're using at the moment are absolutely dreadful. So I would say actually um, uh, taking the, the wide view of X-ray binary work, the van der Land model does not work and we should not use it anymore. It is still being used in some quarters, um, but I don't think we should. Blast waves will probably be closer to the reality for X-ray binaries, but I don't know this for certain, but I think we can test it. Um, and there are some unique aspects, of course, in the X-ray binaries, which is that we can really look at the variability in the accretion flow and actually maybe tie finite phases of variability in the accretion flow to, to phases of jet production. So uh, there are there are real opportunities, I think, for, for understanding relativistic jets by applying the sophisticated theory which has been developed for GRBs or at least some some modified version of it uh, to, to what we see in X-ray binaries and perhaps being able to move the X-ray binary point up here. OK, so let me just tell you uh, how I think we're going to be able to measure the size and Lorentz factor uh, of these ejector in the future with more observations like those that we see from 1820. So what you see on the left is the evolution of the Lorentz factor uh, uh, from some ejector. And what I've taken here is a model where the Lorentz factor varies as T to the minus three uh, eighths, which is an adiabatic blast wave model propagating through a uh, homogeneous ISM. And I set the Lorentz factors to start decreasing uh, a time of about uh, 10 to the six seconds. So you can see we start with gamma five, it starts decreasing as a power law. These are log log plots, and then it, it gets to a uh, Lorentz factor of one. And what I'm doing in this case is I'm, tell I'm showing you what you would see uh, if these uh, ejector were propagating at 60 degrees to the line of sight. So although these models are largely used these days for GRBs, what I'm choosing here is an angle to the line of sight, which is more, uh, more typical for X-ray binaries. And what you would see actually is for a long time, you see a phase which is be indistinguishable in measurements from uh, ballistic motion, despite the fact that the Lorentz factor is decreasing. Um, but then you do begin to see a measurable de uh, deceleration and eventually termination. And that begins around 10 to the seven seconds uh, in this particular model, which is the point at which the Lorentz factor crosses two. So as a rule of thumb, and I think a useful rule of thumb, we can say that we can, uh, the point at which our ejector begin to look like they're no longer ballistic is the point at which the ejector are moving with a Lorentz factor of two. So the proposed method would be the following, measure the size, and I'll come to that in a moment, the flux and position at multiple epochs, and we'll get the internal energy. We can compare this uh, to some models. These are th th these are kind of very soy, uh, sorry, very simple toy uh, discussions of what the, uh, the equations would be like, but I'm just demonstrating we would have the measurables. We'd measure E, we'd measure R, 
and the thing which would be the unknown would be how much kinetic energy via some efficiency parameter had gone into reheating the ejector. So I really think we'd be measuring all the things we need to solve this problem. Um, and then essentially what we need to do is we need to connect to the gamma two point uh, to the point uh, 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 in our data. And we know at that point gamma was approximately two. And we know how much delta kinetic energy there was between all our prior observations. And we can work backwards towards the, the launch point and all the total energy which was in the ejector then. So what I'm really talking about is making a whole load of observations as my blob is ejected or whatever it is, my shock. Um, we know we can measure the position and we know that at least in one case in Joe Bright's work, we measured the size and I'm going to argue, well, I'm going to demonstrate that we'll be able to measure the size continuously in the near future. If we can measure the kinetic energy here and the internal energy, we can work our way back to, uh, to towards the launch and what the initial kinetic energy was. OK, so let me talk about large scale decelerating jets and what we found from Meerkat. Now, before 2018, there was only really one black hole jet which had been seen to clearly decelerate. Um, and that was the jets launched from the black hole transient XTEJ 1550 back in 1998, discovered serendipitously by Stefan Corbell and myself in 2000 um, and studied in detail in radio uh, and in particular in X-ray, um, uh, several beautiful studies such as this one by Migliori et al. 2017. This was the only example that we had prior to uh, Meerkat. However, things have changed a lot. So since we began observing with Meerkat, now admittedly also with data from other radio telescopes, the VLA, APTCA and eMerlin, we've had a revolution in this area. So the first one I want to me uh, mention, and um, apologies to Tom Russell, who I think is on the line, but this is probably the least dramatic of the decelerations I'm going to show you. Effectively, they get better across the, the four I show you. But this was a beautiful example uh, of ejections from Maxi J 1535 tracked out to a large distance and then with very good uh, uh, evidence for deceleration at late times. The next example I'll show you is 1820, which we've already discussed. Again, very strong evidence for deceleration um, at about half a year uh, after launch from the black hole. Um, a much more dramatic example uh, is the case of Maxi J1348 by uh, Francesco Caratanuto uh, and others, where apparently ballistic motion was seen early on. The ejector faded, but then when they rebrightened about a year later, we saw that they were almost not moving. There is some significant motion here, but it's actually much, much slower than the initial relativistic launch. Um, and then finally, and please don't please don't go off and, and chase this one up. This is work still in prep by Tremu et al. We're observing uh, another transient Maxi J1848 where we've seen ejector propagate not very far at all from the core and basically decelerate very, very rapidly, but to continue to brighten. So we're actually directly observing the injection of jet energy into the interstellar medium. So prior to 1998, uh, there, were, there was one example in the whole of radio studies of black holes, and now we have four more in the last four years. So there's a, there's a summary putting these together. We have 1535, 1820, 1840, sorry, 1348, and now 1848. So we're essentially finding about one per year. And of course, the situation is going to get better uh, as Meerkat uh, evolves into Meerkat Plus uh, and SK uh, Phase 1. Um, so if I compile all these results together, again, this is what we knew when we only knew about 1550, which was the jets were tracked on VLBI scales and then disappeared for two years. Um, and then we tracked them later in radio and X-ray. So we, we knew that the motion can't have been ballistic, but we don't really know what happened in between. These are uh, this is now adding in all the data that we have from Meerkat uh, only for the new systems that we've observed. We can see 1348 propagated out to the, the largest distance, and we can see a range of slopes here indicating a range of uh, different uh, apparent speeds. If I correct these sources for the distance to the source, um, then I can actually turn this into projected distance. And what we see is that the jets are stopping on a range of projected distances from a few times 10 to the 17 centimetres to a few times 10 to the 18 centimetres. And of course, if the collimation is the same and the interstellar medium is broadly the same, then actually the distance that these jets propagate to will actually tell us directly about the energy which was in the ejection event uh, via the, the calculation originally made by Sedov. 
OK, so I've, I've suggested a few times that we're also going to be able to measure the size regularly, but how will we go about doing that? Um, and I would argue that uh, in the future, after 20 days, we will always be able to measure the size of these ejecta. So it goes as follows. Um, so here are, here's a, a timeline from uh, zero to 400 days, and here's the angular size of the ejecta, and we have a single point for our decelerating Meerkat ejecta. And this is the measurement made by Joe Bright at 90 days for Maxi J1820. And what I've drawn on here are two lines. One is for linear expansion at a constant speed uh, of the ejector. So that's the blue line. And the other line here is one particular model for how a relativistic blast wave uh, might evolve in size as a function of time. Now, what Joe did is Joe made an observation with Meerkat at L-band and simultaneously with E. Merlin at L-band. And these dotted lines here indicate the angular resolutions of these two arrays. And by comparing the flux, he measured with Meerkat and the flux he measured with E-Merlin, we were able to make this estimate of the size. As I've said, however, Meerkat will shortly evolve into Meerkat Plus and on a time scale of about four or five years will become the mid-frequency component of the SKA. Because the mid-frequency component of the SKA has nearly as good angular resolution as E-Merlin, but retains the Meerkat core and in addition will be more sensitive than Meerkat, this means that a single observation with SKA1 mid of these kind of ejector, which we now we now know are happening at least you know one of these big events every year, will directly measure the size. We will be able to measure the, the flux on a huge range of baselines, and I suspect we'll be able to directly image uh, the ejector, given that we'll have superb sensitivity, or sensitivity on a large range of angular scales. So I would argue that uh, from uh, from about five years from now, we will be able to directly measure not only the, the angular separation from the core, but the angular size of ejector uh, for all of these large scale ejections. Um, let me very briefly mention that uh, some ideas about what we need to do um, inside 20 days, um, because prior to 20 days, probably SK1 mid will not be able to directly uh, resolve the eject. It will be able to resolve perhaps uh, um, the larger scale jets, as I said, but not inside this region. And I think there's a range of ways of doing this. One is to use uh, millimeter flares combined with estimates of synchrotron self-absorption. And another way is actually to directly use the Event Horizon Telescope. So the data that you're seeing here are a sequence of millimeter uh, and radio flares observed from the black hole binary V404 Cygni uh, back in 2015. The highest frequency that these flares were observed at was 666 gigahertz, and there were a lot of observations at 350 gigahertz, which are the orange points in this figure. So the first point to mention is that these flares get extremely bright. Although we're used to seeing flares down at the sub-Jansky level in the centimetre band, which are these, uh, these, these little uh, low-level bumps down here, the kind of yellow-coloured uh, uh, flaring, at much higher frequencies, you have much sharper flares which reach really high uh, uh, flux density levels. This means that these flux densities are easily enough to be measured and imaged if there's resolvable structure by the Event Horizon Telescope. Furthermore, um, we have good spectral evidence that these peaks that we're seeing in the light curve are due to synchrotron self-absorption. And furthermore, we can track these peaks actually as they propagate downwards in frequency. So these ejector, they, and, and this is, this is a standard assumption for all of these jet models, they peak brightest and earliest at high frequencies. But if we can catch the peak at lower frequencies and apply models, we can track the size. So what I did is I took, well, Alex Tetarenko provided me with, uh, with four sequences, sequences of flares where she identified the peak at 666 gigahertz all the, or high, at least high frequencies, all the way down to the centimeter band. I was able to fit synchrotron self-absorption models to those peaks and track how the size of individual ejections uh, evolved uh, with time. So this is a compilation of all of those data. So what you see here, um, this is the radius of the ejector, where in this case I've plotted it uh, in terms of gravitational radio. This is the time, the estimated time since launch. Now, of course, the time stamps between individual peaks are unambiguous, but what we don't know is actually how long after the launch event the first peak occurred. That's why um, you'll see that we can, we can interpret this in different ways. And then this is the estimated distance from the core. 
And what I'm drawing on here, this is the angular resolution uh, of the Event Horizon Telescope, and this is the angular resolution of typical uh, VLBA uh, observations at, uh, say, a few gigahertz. And I also draw the, the same line on here horizontally, which is the angular resolution of the EHT. So if we correct that the very highest frequency peak actually happened very shortly after the ejection event, say in this case 13 seconds, then what it looks like um, for a constant outwards velocity is that actually the jet transition from something like parabolic to conical uh, expansion rate. Now this is very preliminary and in fact is, is has a large chance of being incorrect, but some of you will be aware that actually this is the kind of structure which has been seen uh, in a number of uh, jets from active galactic nuclei. If, as seems more likely, there was a much longer delay, let's uh, increase this by two orders of magnitude, then what we see is uh, that the, uh, the, the evolution of the size of the ejector is much more, uh, more like a single power law. However, what we see in this circumstance is actually that we would be able to track the motions of the ejector with the Event Horizon Telescope. We're well, uh, we're well beyond the uh, angular resolution of the Event Horizon Telescope. So if this is the, the real situation, um, then and the components are easily bright enough, then Event Horizon Telescope will actually be able to track these bullets uh, in the very earliest phases of ejection. So I think this is the way that we probe the very inner scales uh, of these ejector. And again, we would have the, the, the angular separation from the core and from applying our synchrotron self-absorption model, we'd have the size. Okay, so I will wrap up there. I think I've just about got to 45 minutes. So um, I would say that observations of large scale decelerating jets with Meerkat have really transformed the field. I don't think many of us expected to be still observing these jets months uh, after the initial ejection event. And the reason we've picked them up is because we continued monitoring these sources with a telescope which has very high surface sensitivity and was able to pick them up. Once we picked them up, uh, we, we saw them decelerate and we've now seen that in four sources. And again, there was not much work in the community previously uh, on what that deceleration really could mean and tell us about the ejector. And then, of course, now we have the, re the realization that we can spatially resolve these ejector as well, um, and that uh, once SKA phase one comes along, we'll be able to do this regularly. I think, from my point of view, this is one of the most exciting developments uh, in the jets from these stellar mass black holes, and I would say has brought us to the brink of a revolution in our understanding of the power connected with these jets. Furthermore, via you know uh, exquisite X-ray observations, which have been going on for a long time, and new VLBI uh, methods, such as those developed by Callum Wood, and hopefully in the near future, the application of the Event Horizon Telescope to these uh, to these uh, to these phenomena, we really should be able to to probe what's happening right around the time of launch as well. And I think it's possible that in the you know in the within the next decade or so, we will have a number of events where we have tracked the ejection all the way from prior to the ejection event, maybe at 100 or 1,000 RG, all the way through the interaction of the accreting material with the black hole, and all the way to the ultimate deceleration of the ejector, which were launched in that event, maybe a year later in the interstellar medium. Of course, reality is going to be much more complex than this. People are uh, making uh, all the time uh, complex models, uh, uh, relativistic MHD models, which show that the reality is not this simple. But bear in mind that the light curves we measure do tend to be simple power laws. So, so relatively self-similar physics does appear to dominate. And also remember that the observations, which I hope we'll be able to make soon, will be essentially model independent. We'll be able to measure the flux, the uh, angular separation, uh, and the size of these ejector regularly uh, as a function of time. And I think that's really going to tell us a lot about these jets. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>